you, Smita ji, and for a wonderful session, Raghavan ji. So, very warm welcome to all of you in today's edition of Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita. I uh, hope you're having a wonderful day um, or had a great day. So, we will continue on our journey on the interesting topic that we were talking about, Rogam Bhog, right, yesterday. And today we will move on to 4.32 and talk about the essential ingredient in all the practices that we do, uh, which is needed. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get underway. We have a hard stop at 10, so we will pace ourselves accordingly. Let me share my screen and let's get started. Are you able to see my screen? You can see it, man. Yeah. Okay. We'll do our opening prayers and get underway. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwar Ha, Guru Sakshat Par Brahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha. Vasudev Sutam Devam Kamsachanur Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening, all of you. Uh, let's get started. So today we are going to do 4.32. I'm going to recite it and then uh, we can have participants follow it as well. Evam bahu vida yagya viteta brahmano mukhe karma jan viditan sarvan Evam Gyatva Vimoksha Se. All right. Let's have a few participants. Shamba, you can call them out. Sandhya, Radhe, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe, Sandhya. Evam Bahu Vidhaya Gyatva Vidhata Brahman Omukhe Karma Jan Vidhi Tan Sarvan Evam Gyatva Vimoksha Se. Very nice, Radhe Radhe, thank you. Ode Kumarji, Radhe Radhe. Yeah, Radhe Radhe. Evam Bahu Vida Yegna Vitata Brahma No Muke Karma Jan Vidhi Tan Sarvam. Evam Jnatva Vimoksha Se Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Thank you, Rishi. Okay, let's take a few more hands. Pahil Ji, Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Evam Bahu Vidhaya Gna Vidhita Brahma No Mukhe Karma Jan Vidhi Tanvat Karma Jan Vidhi Tan Sarvan Evam Janatva Vimok Evam Gyatva Vimokshe Evam Gyatva Vimokshe Sorry, Radhe Radhe. Boys, Radhe Radhe, let's take a few more hands. Aparna ji, Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe, everyone. Evam Bahu Vidha Yadnyam Vitata Brahmano Mukhe Karma jan vidhi tan sarvan evam netva vimokshya se. Thank you. You? Evam bahu vidha yagya vidhita brahmano mukhe karma jan vidhi tan sarvan evam gyatva vimokshya se. Radhe Radhe, thank you. Okay. Sam, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. Evam bahu vidha yagna vitata brahmano mukhe karma jan vidditan sarvan evam gnatva vimoksha se. Very nice. Next. Kajananji, Radhe, Radhe. Anji, Radhe, Radhe. 
राधे राधे एवं बहु विद्या यज्ञाता ब्रह्म नो मुखे कर्म जान विधितान सर्व एवं ज्ञान विमोक्ष से very nice thank you vajayan ji and thank you for turning on the video welcome to the session okay let's quickly take the remaining two hands and then we'll get started ji ji radhe 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 evam bahu vida yagna vidata brahma no mukhe karm jhan viditan sarvan एवं ज्ञात्वा विमोक्षसे नाइस थैंक यू राधे 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 लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट या थैंक यू राधे 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 एवं बहु विधा यज्ञ वित्तता ब्रह्म नो मुख हे कर्म जान विधितान सर्वान एवं Sarvan evam gyatva vimoksha se. Sorry, I missed that one. No Thank worries. you, Radha Mare. Thank you, Pagi Ji. So let's get started. So in this shloka, Lord Krishna is saying all these different kinds of sacrifice. Uh, we spoke about the different sacrifice, right? Uh, the breath sacrifice and the gyan, uh, you know, the ashtang yoga, all this, and then the uh, different sacrifice that people undertake. They have been described in the Vedas. Know them as originating from different types of work. This understanding cuts the knots of material bondage. So let's get started with today's topic. So the soul soup segment for today. That we have. So uh, success, happiness, and fulfillment series. my emotions my emotions right we have different emotions as you can see r my responsibility only okay this is a very important concept if you want to have happiness choose happiness and fulfillment in our life this is a very key concept to understand so i'll tell you a story of a guy okay a corporate guy he has a very important client meeting today very very important client meeting today on the other side of the town and it is scheduled for afternoon and of course he knows the driving time because he drives every day so he takes a bit of a margin and wakes up early that day because client is god they say right so there he doesn't want to take a chance so he does plan his day that way but guess what when he wakes up somebody calls him and it's his niece and she drags him to a pointless conversation for 15 20 minutes takes away his time so anyways he somehow manages that conversation and then he he thought that you know what i'm going to rush my car a little faster today to make up for the time lost and be a little early for the meeting make it in time and for the meeting now the drivers they keep cutting him and finally he reaches the highway you know one of those days do you say that when you start your day and then uh, sometimes you will encounter all the green signals and sometimes you will encounter all the red signals so that was kind of a day he started encountering a lot of red signals nevertheless he made it to the highway and he thought okay now this is when i'm going to make up for it but highway what happens he said okay i'm going to trust my luck in highway he sees there's a big jam now he's stuck in the jam to rub salt to injury he sees that there was not even an accident you know there were just couple of people uh, this is a trivial cause for it what is the cause there's no accident and uh, there are two people who were parked by the road side and the passengers were loitering nearby just like that and other people also joined them that what's the party or what's the fun going on there right and what happens they that caused the traffic jam and that annoys him even further it's not even an accident because of which he is stuck and ultimately he reaches office how much 45 minutes late and then his manager he gives him a piece of his mind okay such an important client meeting you were supposed to come here and you are 45 minutes late 
client is king and you know how we treat clients now this whole thing unfolded and you've got an awful mood for the day right so much has happened since morning now this guy is he supposed to blame for his awful mood or a negative emotion that he's having on the client who scolded him or his manager in front of him or the drivers that caused the traffic jam or the cars that cut him off in the sub you know or his niece who you know took his time for 15 minutes whom should he blame for this kind of a mood that day that just the imperfect day that one has and the point here is it's very easy for him to put a blame on anybody there but none of them is responsible for these emotions no matter how terrible anybody's behavior towards you there is no justification for harboring odious thoughts is the key learning here our feelings are a choice that we make and the responsibility of controlling our mind is our own whether we choose pleasant or miserable sentiments we are accountable for the way we think buck stops at us okay and if you are one of those who finds a convenient excuse a punching bag around you it's about time to change that mindset okay it's not going to take us very far and we are not doing ourselves a great favor about it okay so the key thing is there is there is something called reaction and there is something called response there is a stimulus there is a trigger point and then there is a react you know you react to it if you introduce a synapse uh, that synapses is there if you introduce a bit of a gap a lot of good things can happen there and those who do not understand this gap they are always reactionary in nature those who understand this gap they understand that the steering wheel of their feelings it does not lie in the hands of others they control that completely okay god has given us that freedom and called free will and we always have a choice to make now i'll tell you a story to inspire you further there was a guy called victor frankl go check it out google he has written a book called man's search for meaning now this guy if your situation is worse just imagine this guy's situation and what he's doing this guy he was uh, you know no he was an austrian jew and you know we know what happens with jews during the world war 2 and he was a practicing neurologist and a psychiatrist with a deep interest in psychology his mastery over the subject you know can be gauged on the fact that he submitted so many papers on psychology to sigmund freud who's the father of modern psychology okay that is who he was however um you know he when hitler went on the rampage he was also one of the captives in his nazi camps and in his nazi camp in auschwitz prison if you go to that concentration camp you'll understand how pitiable miserable situation the prisoners were subjected to and he was one of them uh, and then he was separated from his wife and daughter and later on when he was in the camp he came to know that they have both have died and then he mentions that he was made to walk uh, you know walk naked in the night and not even knowing whether he would be alive the next morning or not and when he was going through these indescribable tribulations he discovered the freedom that he possessed in that dark hour something dawned upon him he said he had a freedom that nobody could snatch away from him and what was that freedom the ability to choose his emotional attitude in midst of all of this that was happening and he said i am going to be cheerful no matter what and often he would be seen smiling and even laughing people would ask him what made him happy he said you know that he did not have control over external situation but he did have control over his mind and he realized that person who has nothing left in the world can still experience bliss by harboring right thoughts and he was a one of the very few who could survive that ordeal he came back and he announced this discovery to the others in the world as well and when the world war ended you know this guy was released from in when he he came back to vienna and he started practicing his profession again and he he opened a school of psychology which was called logotherapy also known as third vienna school of psychotherapy that is what he ended up doing so basically he went in then he went on to travel throughout the world and speaking in 219 universities and all but the point here is that life does not always serve us chocolates and cakes it may serve us lemons now the choice is with us whether we want to you know dwell upon our misery or want to make a lemonade out of it and move on okay so that is a key lesson 
responsibility of our emotions lies with us and you cannot put a blame on anybody else. Okay. We'll continue on this topic in our next session, but let's move on to our topic of our discussion today. Now, one of the beautiful features of our Vedas is that they recognize and cater to the variety of human beings which are out there. And that is why you have so many different kinds of sacrifices. They have been described for different kinds of performers. Vedas are like the most democratic thing that you would see. It doesn't say only if you do this will you get God. Otherwise, you'll go to hell. Like we, have, we might have heard it somewhere. Only if you do this, will you go to heaven? Otherwise, you'll go to hell. Nothing of that sort. Everybody is welcome because it appreciates that different people have different propensities. So it's like a journal, journal merchant store. Depending upon your propensity, it has a way for you to work with it and move forward in your spirituality. So if you are doing Dravya Yagya, basically, then you will get material rewards. We have spoken about it. Dravya Yagya means material things that you offer. If you do Ashtang Yoga, then knowing super soul and heart, and again, your um, you will basically have a union with Paramatma. That would be the end goal. If you are doing Gyan Yoga, you are seeking liberation, moksha. And if you're doing pranayam, fasting, other austerities, then it purifies the senses. So these are different outcomes of the different practices that we do. Now, however, the key essence is to, what is the key essence is to, okay, what happened? Live 52, have you seen this live 52 before? Okay. Okay, it's not a coincidence. There's a reason why we have a live 52 here. The people in India might be aware of it. So live 52 for liver, it did not, move off the medical shop shelves when it was introduced because it is a medicine for your it's a liver tonic okay for the benefit of people who don't know what is live 52 it's a medicine that uh, if you're grown up in india the kids are given it's a very nice syrup i used to enjoy it a lot i can look forward to having live 52 because it's very sweet but when it was originally introduced it used to be bitter in its original taste because it is meant to be a tonic for your liver but it did not move off the medical shop shelves. Nobody would buy it. It was so bitter. So what did they do? They added sugar to it. Okay. Now similarly, Vedas do have many angles and parts. Okay. God knows that not everybody would be attracted towards devotion to God. So said, all right, let me add some sugar rosary words. If you do this, you'll get this. You'll do this, you'll get this. Worship to God, pray to God, do this, yagya, do that. All that was added. So it was like added sugar. However, the key ingredient, if you look at it, a sense is to simply love God. Okay, Get into bhakti. Simply God, love God for the God. For the sake of God. Ask God for God. Okay, That is the sense of the whole scriptures. But for you to get started or for you to incentivize initially is added a bit of rosary stuff like in our Vedas. Okay, you do this and then you'll go there. If you do your duty, you'll go to heaven and all that stuff and people get attracted towards that as well but deep philosophers and people who get the benefit of uh, the the deeper philosophy especially when they meet a guru they understand these are just a means to an end they're not an end in itself the key thing is to do radhe govind govind radhe with faith devotion and develop love for god okay they don't get sidetracked by the sugary stuff they go to the right essence of thing, right? So people who are health conscious, they will directly drink karela juice. They don't say, I need sugar in that or this and that. Because they understand that's the real thing. So this is the key essence of scriptures, okay? So I think this Live 52 example was pretty relevant, so I loved it. Anyways, let's move on. Now, the common thread running through them is that they are to be done with devotion as a, they are to be doing doing devotion basically. Now, let's look at it. These are the different paths we spoke about. Ashtang Yoga, Bhakti, somebody's performing austerity, somebody's doing Yagya, somebody's reading scriptures, all that stuff. Actually, it should lead you to love for God. That is the key essence here. Okay. I hope it makes sense. Uh, and then, so with this understanding, one is not bewildered by the multifarious instructions in the Vedas. And by pursuing the particular yagya suitable to one's nature, one can be released from material bondage. That is the key. I hope it's making sense. Now let me move on. Today we are going to have a fascinating discussion because I'm going to bring up some stuff that we all can relate to. 
and have a good a good discussion on that as well. So the essence is bhakti. Essence is level up love for God. If if any practice that we are doing is not resulting in developing love for God or increasing faith in God, it's a mechanical exercise. It's something is better than nothing. But the real thing is, it should lead you to develop um, devotional sentiments towards God, deepening your faith in God, and increasing your love for God. That is the key essence of the scriptures. Now, let's look at it. Yes, philanthropy. We like to help people. We do like to do charity. Um, we want to serve people. Uh, that is one mode in which people like to uh, invest their time on. Some people make philanthropy as the motto of their life, agenda of their life itself. You know, you see some of the biggest biggest billionaires and millionaires now, after gathering all the wealth, they still feel a sense of dissatisfaction that what they thought they would get at the peak of their um, you know, material achievements, they're still not getting it. So they become great philanthropists. Rockefeller, when it started with Rockefeller, Rockefeller is one of the biggest ones in the history, uh, recent history. Now, more recently, you look at Bill Gates. He has picked up so many agendas in life to, you know, look at the medicine for AIDS or cure malaria from this world and those kind of agendas. Uh, Warren Buffet also has recruited. So a lot of people do philanthropy around it, right? So they make those as a goal of their life. Then you have people who follow rituals. They follow rituals to the tea, right? Which hand has to be rotated how many times, how the tikka has to be applied, which all fast they have to do, you know, full moon, Sharad Purnima, this mata, that mata, everything, every ritual they were performed to the letter T. So they can perform rituals as well. Some people are very, very particular about following. And some of the rituals can be pretty demanding as well, where a lot of discipline, perseverance, and faith is needed for you to do that, right? So some people resort to a lot of ritualistic following as well. Then people have do yogic practices as well. We, we spoke about the yogic practices. There are so many yogic practices that you do. Um, not only for your well-being, but to increase your focus. And, and especially if you are in the Ashtang Marg, this, this, this becomes the center uh, or the focal point of your day-to-day uh, -day practice, spiritual practice as well. So people do yogic practices. Then what? Activism. People have certain agendas in life, right? That they think are important to them. It could be, you know, uh, taking on a agenda of preserving your religion, your tradition, your brethren, or could be any cause, right? You may stand up for some cause in the world which you feel very associated to. Some people do fundraising for heart patients. Somebody would pick up some another agenda in life. Somebody wants to sponsor a girl child. So there are so many activities we get involved in. So activism is another kind of an activity people undertake. Then you have scriptural studies. Some people like to study, absorb knowledge like a sponge, you know, different places they will go, listen to everybody and keep on absorbing knowledge and that becomes the focal point of their life. They like to invest time in reading as many books as possible, as many scriptures as possible, listen to as many katha vachaks or, uh, you know, people uh, who impart knowledge. Uh, so that, that becomes the focal point of their life. And then, there are people who go for professional excellence. Whatever they are doing, they want to do it really well and make an impact because their strong sense of uh, purpose, you know, work defines a strong set, sense of purpose for them. So whatever they are doing, they leave their signatures on that and they achieve professional excellence as well. We see so many entrepreneurs, we see so many uh, Nobel laureates, we see so many researchers, we see so many um, uh, innovators, they, they just achieve a lot of professional excellence in their life as well. So typically, these are some of the areas where human endeavors take them to the next level or they make it a focal point of their life. Whether it's scriptural studies, professional excellence, activism, yogic practice, ritualistic stuff, right? If you are good at fasting, you will keep on fasting. Right? Anna Hazare was pretty good at fasting, right? Until Kejriwal discovered him. Philanthropy, right? some people make that as a focal point of their life as well. 
Now the question, key question here is, now if I tell you the all zeros, you'll say, what? What are you talking about? How can they be zeros, right? I mean, as a human, it's a big achievement. Of course, it is a big achievement, but I would basically, strictly speaking, through our scriptures, they are all zeros we have to have added in your life. All zeros. Isn't it mind-blowing? Somebody tells you, you, you have achieved so much in life, you know, you've spent your life helping people and being so generous and, you know, the person, people, everybody loves uh, and they say, you know, this is the guy who's the most helpful girl, most pleasant and the most helpful person. Or you're the person who have always done all the all the rituals perfectly. Um, you know, whichever festival comes, whichever ritual comes, you do it really perfectly. Or you have done your yogic practices or even as an activist, you have discharged your duty to for the cause that you have done. You devoted your life to it. Or scriptural studies, you know, said I have read so many of books and my... Knowledge acquisition was my only goal in life. And professionally, you excelled, really excelled well. And when you excel professionally, you take a lot of people along with you as well. It cannot be a single man success, right? If you if you do really well, there are a lot of people who get benefited from it as well as a, as a consequence, right? If Apple Apple became the what it was, there were so many people who who got benefited from it as well. Yes, Rahul, go ahead. You're saying something. Radhe, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. There is a comment from. Parna ji, she says that some people feel that they need to stand for life, so they keep involving themselves in different philanthropic activities. They would need to what? Sorry, I missed that part. I mean, it is not a question, just a comment, yeah, that they keep involving themselves in different philanthropic activities. Yeah. But it's a, it's a good deed, actually. Now, if at the end of this, you come to know that it was all zeros, how would it feel? It will not feel good, right? It is actually, strictly speaking, it is zeros only. If you just do that, it's zeros because, because unless it is supplemented with devotion, you have not added that one, which will make it a million. Okay. Six, I put six zeros because I picked six activities. There are tons of other activities too. The devotion aspect, if you have not brought God into the mix on any of these, then that one is missing, which will lend value or make the impact of zero being felt. That is a key concept. You will say, you'll ask how, how would that work? How would that work is because, sure, it's good. These activities are, you are operating in a sattvic mode because God is not there. You cannot go beyond sattva. At best, you can go to sattva. It will be a combination, actually. It will be a combination of sattvic and rajasic. Okay, not purely sattvic as well, but predominantly might be sattvic, especially if you are going, doing it with a good intent and sincerity and, you know, helping people out and that kind of a mindset. But sattvic, rajasic and possibly tamasic as well at times because you are still suffering from your mental afflictions. There's not possible that you're working and you're interacting with so many things and situations and circumstances around and negativity doesn't come to your mind. Not possible because the quality of mind is still the same. So what at best what will happen is you will get as a prize, you will get a celestial award or a higher planet for a temporary period of time. It's like, all right, employer says you have done a lot of job, good job. This time I will give you a bonus and a return ticket to Hawaii as well. So he'll say, okay, enjoy your bonus and go to Hawaii or whichever place you want or maybe Mars. Okay, if they figured out there are good tourist spots there, then what happens? The bonus, the money gets over and the hotel payment is over. What happens? Are they going to let you stay in Hawaii? They'll say, no, go back now. Time to go back. So same thing happens. When we do good deeds like these, you know, we have led a very meaningful life, very nice, noble life. And uh, we have achieved something and we have done something for the humanity as well uh, in the process. What will happen is you'll go to the celestial abodes and then you'll have to make a trip back. And when you make a trip back, what will happen? Are you going to be treated with a lot of respect? No. It's like when you have already... You don't, you can't double dip into your benefits. It's like once benefit are given and once you have availed it, then you have to earn it back in order to get that trip again. But the problem with that trip is that trip is temporary and then you are back into the fold of 8.4 million. So the one, unless we add that one, then you are truly accruing some merit, which is tracking you closer to the goal of life. This is not the goal of life to enjoy a luxurious life, deluxe life. Uh, golden jail after this life 
by going to swarga or any higher planets or a better better kind of existence at all so the one is the devotional part of it so the secret ingredient what we are trying to tell in today's session is whether it is you know the breathing techniques whether it's the austerities you are performing uh, whether it is gyan yoga ashtanga yoga if you don't mix devotion to it it is a purely mechanical drill nothing else it cannot take you uh, closer to god because you have to mix god into the bring god into the mix in whatever practice you are doing in order to purify the quality of your mind and also to take you closer to the goal of life which is cleansing of your antakaran and then gaining eligibility to get out of this material existence at all yes sir you had a question yeah rajesh yeah. there is a question in the chat from shweta ji uh, should all sacrifices be done without any expectations in addition to the devotion aspect aspect expectations when you do expectation that means you are doing a transaction right to bin mange mile moti mange mile na bhik so point here is that you do sacrifice because you are your constitutional position is to serve and in the serving you should automatically receive what you need counterintuitive but this is how it works when you do it with an expectation there is a possibility that you may even become an atheist now you will say you know what i did mata somvar how many somvar and all that stuff and mata rani did not do kripa on me because what i had asked for did not happen on the contrary something bad happened in my life because you had expectation so when you have built an expectation there are only two outcomes either the expectation is fulfilled or it is not that is dictated by your karmas and lot of other factors now if your expectation is not fulfilled there is a good chance then you will become an atheist you will say i have been doing it for so long and then mata rani doesn't do anything for me so that expectation should not be there in true devotion you don't build an expectation you let god decide what is best for you and you simply ask for strength devotion and and uh, you know wisdom around whatever comes your way you should be able to face it and it should not shake your faith on god that is the only thing to be asked but if we are making our secret wish list then there's a good probability we will lose faith in god over a period of time and and because now we are making it conditional we are putting a condition in narad bhakti darshan it is said devotion is kamna rahitam gun rahitam right gandhlesh uh, basically uh, uh, swa sukh vasna it is completely selfless so not even a trace of it is not even tainted with a trace of self seeking at all and you are not even attracted towards gun of god when we get attracted towards gun that is also not selfless and of course kamna rahita means you don't go with the kamna or some kind of a secret desire that okay this should get fulfilled then it's not devotion that is transaction or a business at that point so that expectation should not be there to put it short yeah yes himanshu Hello, dear everyone. Ah, uh, uh, I just want to say that when Swami Ji says uh, that uh, when if your sadhana is continuously increasing, then naturally uh, the expression to express like the love for God will increase like def- automatically. So we will not even think that we are doing any sacrifice, right? Because naturally we will do seva from inside. Very true. Question. Good point you brought in, Himanshu. So when you serve your kid. do you think you're doing a sacrifice there of course not you think you you feel pleasure in serving so somebody whom you you love that sacrifice is um, you don't even feel that is a sacrifice it comes very naturally and spontaneously to you so seva is a spontaneous expression of your love you don't have to put in an effort you won't even have a feeling i'm doing a sacrifice at that point very nicely declared yeah and then somebody may say that you know i don't even have any skills or anything to offer how can i serve god so that is your mind playing tricks at all there is always something we can do for god there is always something we we can offer to god however small it might be if shabri could serve god all of us can if durani could serve god i mean although she had prepared banana for had kept some fresh bananas for him anybody and everybody can if we just need to make a desire and an intent right god will take care of it everything else he will provide you means he will give you inspiration everything he'll do the only thing that we need to control is our intent behind it 
make a desire, make an intent and see things unfold. Everybody can serve God in some way or another, right? While cooking, we can serve God. While taking, you know, cleaning our home, we can do that. So every sentiment can be dovetailed towards God. So, it, and then we don't know. I mean, God can make us do wonderful things. We 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 don't even know what we are capable of, and uh, we don't know which which script or which music God will enable in us and get some big thing done. He picks up people in humans only, right, to get something big done, and it could be us because we made that desire. It can happen all by itself. All right. I think other question was, can we make tattoo on our body of God? So I at least haven't come across. So I would, it's a bit technical question. I mean, based on my little understanding, God's name is auspicious. However, to carry it as a tattoo, does it come with some other baggage or not? I'm not sure. So it might be a question I can ask Swamiji in next SMX or somebody can ask. Can we carry God's tattoo on our body? I don't know. Um, but if, if it helps us remember God, I, I don't see any problem in carrying that at all, right? Because God's name is auspicious. But does it come with any other baggage where we have to take care of some stuff because God's name is God's name? I'm not sure about that. So I don't want to stick my neck out and say no, no problem at all. Um, but yes, if, if it is a trigger point for you to remember God or always keep God in mind, I don't see any harm at all. Hanumanji had that tattoo, right? When he opened up his chest. Shri Ram or something was written, right? It was an internal tattoo, which is a good thing, right? Yes, Shamdi, you're asking something? Yeah, Sandhya, Sandhya please go ahead. Um, yes, Radhavadi, like two quick things. One regarding, yeah, as you mentioned. So, uh, like Maharaji says that actually there is nothing that we have of any worth that we can offer to God, right? But Bhav ke bouke hai wo. So that is one thing that all of us can offer. So that is what we should be offering, right? As you just very beautifully described that. And second point is regarding this tattoo thing. Like that's also another thing that Maharaji says that God is pure. So wherever you go, whatever you're doing, I mean, you cannot, uh, I mean, in some sense, right, uh, do anything wrong. I mean, so his name is there wherever. That shouldn't be a problem from that logic, right? That's how I feel, but uh, I would not give that. I mean, I would categorically ask that question and rather have it here from Swamiji or Maharajji than say, okay, this is what I think. But yeah, as far as my little understanding goes, it should not be a problem at all. I mean, the purpose matters, of course. Like that is, I think, the defining factor. Yep. Yes, Shamji. Yeah, there's a comment Stop from Sandhya. Accepting and start accepting. That is the more thing, right? I saw that quote. Stop yeah. expecting, start accepting. Yeah. Yes, Sandhya says the same thing. Sandhya says, stop expecting and start accepting. Life will be easy. And then, as Himanshu and Sandhya both said, that as we do for our kids, so we don't every time say, Ki I'm doing for them. It's by default. So, can't it be for God also? Suppose once I'm settled in for God, I know whatever I'm doing for God. So, Every time we say, yes, this is for you, this is for you. But in the back of my mind, I'm, I, 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 I know I'm sure that this is whatever I do from onwards, it's for God. So do I have to make a point every time I do something that Bhagwanji, is it necessary or is it not? So he doesn't, I mean, you don't have to state it. If it is happening, it's there in your heart. That's more than enough, right? God is, he can read your most secret thoughts as well. So you don't have to announce it to the world or anybody or to yourself as well. Right? If you're thinking it, it's that there at the back of your mind. That's all. What if he doesn't understand Hindi? Same way we do for God. Is it? Can it be so? It can be so. No? It can be the same way. Yeah. Because when we help or when we take care of kids or our parents, we are doing for God. Because when we help or when we take care of our kids or our parents, that's by default, it is our nature that we have to be with them. True, Shambhai. The key thing is you have to decide where your attachment is, right? So if you're doing things, you don't have to say that. If your attachment is already in God, so that, that's all is needed. It's nothing, not a matter of saying or anything because God can read your deepest thoughts and the motives behind anything at all. So if your attachment is there, that's all is needed. Yeah, thank you so much. And there's a comment from Falguni, uh, uh, Falguniji. Can yeah. devotion truly be without gunas? For instance, when I say I am a devotee of God, the I am is there, which can be stated with any gunas. See, I, in Gyanmarg, you, you finish off I. 
right? You say so there is a I and there is a mind. So both merge in Gyan Mark. Okay? There's no mind. They, they say there's no difference between you and God. In Bhakti, I and mind both remain. I becomes, I am the servant of God. Mind becomes, God is mine. So you keep that sentiment always. Okay, don't you don't need to let go of I. Just keep that knowledge that I am an eternal servant of God. And in sacrifice or in an offering, I will I shall receive what I need. And that that happens. You give it, what goes around comes around. Hand serves the stomach, it automatically gets everything. It's in giving you shall receive. So the same concept goes. But when you try to hold things for yourself, become selfish. That is the most unholy thing we can do to ourselves. And that is the cause of anxiety, misery and so many mental afflictions that we struggle with throughout our lives and still don't understand that you know, just had to change the formula of how we think. Just the thinking aspect and everything will start falling in place. Yes, Rahul? There is an excellent comment from Sandhya Ji that kehne ki zarurat nahi hai, maanne ki hai. Rade, rade. Right. So in Hindi, they say, uh, yeah, we have to believe actually, that is true. The faith, that's where the faith comes up. The day we will start believing, um, I think the magic will start happening automatically. Very true. So these are typically the activities that we engage in our lives. The formula correction that is needed is we need to mix, add God to it somehow in some form or manner, right? Right from when we wake up till the time we go to sleep, the God has to be built into our consciousness even when we are eating food for that matter that we spoke about yesterday. That's all. Right now, we are living a very ungrateful life. It's like living, going to somebody's house and utilizing all the amenities that are available without even bothering to figure out who the owner is and what the expectation of the owner is. Right? We are just chilling out in our own lives with our own troubles, little bubbles that we have created. I have this problem to fix. I have this EMI to pay. I have this. We are not even thinking the big picture part of it. And that is what our scriptures are telling. Now that you are born as a human, start inquiring about the deeper questions of life. Because this opportunity is a rare opportunity. It doesn't come so often. Yes, Aparna Ji. Today we have a hard stop. So if you are interested in singing tomorrow, please. Raja, Raja. Submit your nominations in attendance tracker because we'd like to do it and wrap it up by 10.15 every day. One of the feedbacks I'm getting. So please put in and we'll pick up two or three people every day. Yes, Aparnaji, please go ahead. Uh, Raja, a quick question. How will a common man um, know uh, that without devotion, any great philanthropic work that he does is all ultimately a zero? Common man will not come to know. In fact, even if you tell to common man, they will say, are you kidding me? Okay, I'm doing good because everybody is perfectly situated where they need to be. There's a Taoist saying that every snow flock falls at the right place. So um, it's a journey. When the spiritual spark will come, the, automatically the message will resonate with them very quickly. But if the spiritual spark is not going to come uh, for whatever, based on their past and scars or they are not yet ready, then they will continue to rotate in the cycle that's about it so but for some people they they may be in in uh, not even in these kind of sattvic pursuits they might be in tamasic pursuits but when the calling comes you know something happens and automatically their life changes anguli mal we have heard about it he was a decoy who would cut fingers and when he met buddha his life transformed completely transformed so uh, then people, it, it everybody have their own journey with regards to that, right? Now, if they're supposed to get that exposure, th that knock-knock might be happening, but they may not be ready for it. We all have our knock-knock, right? Um, we, we, we don't uh, open the door. And when we do open it and grace of God falls and then our journey really takes off. But yeah, you're right. It's not a state it's so simple because we are leading lives with doing so many things and how many people have access to this knowledge. Not many. And even people who have access to this knowledge, how many make it a priority? And out of those who make it a priority, how many really try to implement it in their life? And out of those who try to implement in their life, how many do it consistently? And out of those who do it consistently, how many truly end up getting God? So, you know, that it keeps on diminishing at every level. 
Thank it, you. This is how it's meant to be as well. Lord Krishna has said in, uh, I think, Bhagavad Gita only, Sahastra issue, like amongst millions, few strive for it. He understands. And even amongst those few who strive for it, very few get to know me. He's very clearly stated that. And if you take those few and take it across all the multiverses that we have around, there are millions of people who are realizing God every day. Yeah, that is how it goes. Yes. So this this is the aha moment when you get to know that uh, even goodness is is limiting. You have to have God into the mix. Some people are very satisfied in being good, honest, noble, simple in life. But the point is, that is also binding. And it is difficult to get out of sat sattvic pleasure because now you are uh, you get attached to that pleasure as well. And then you, your ego will tell you, you are already doing so many, you are ticking all the boxes in life. Why, why, do, why do we need to believe in something which is as so abstract as God who has seen it and all that stuff? So sattvic pleasure is even more difficult to uh, overcome than uh, rajasic or tamasic pleasures. It can be binding. And people do get attached to it. It's difficult for them to come out of it. But uh, when God graces, you come across a guru. And if you, if you uh, approach somebody with an open mind, uh, and humility that we are going to talk about in 4.34, we are going to get into that shloka, then uh, then uh, you know things can change in our mind. Okay, any other questions on this? So tomorrow we will talk about, um, um, what are we going to talk about? I've forgotten, but I'll remember, okay. But it will be continuation of the topic that we are doing. We'll look at it from a different lens um, the variety that we see around the world and uh, something related to that, why we have. Yeah, so tomorrow's topic is going to be so much of diversity on the path of yoga. We've been talking about yoga and bhog. So why do we have so much of diversity is what we will look at um, uh, philosophically and, and also um, try to get a big picture around it. Yes, Shyamji. There is a question in the chat window from Swita ji. How do we include God every day? Is it by thought or action or deed? Can you explain grace? What is grace? What is grace? Huh? Okay. So, the God, when you say about it, it's through mind. Mansi Bhakti is the thing. If you do it through your words, so you could be doing Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and then your mind will be saying, okay, the milk is on that, okay, milk man has come, or the milk is on the gas, it might be boiling over, or the kid is getting late for the school, Hare Ram, that will not work. So what we do through our body and our senses is multiplication with zero. What truly counts is what we are doing through our mind. So that is the answer to your first question. What you do, you are where your mind is. You are not where your words or where your body is, does not matter. It really boils down to what you are thinking at that point. What was the second question? Um, one is through mind. How do we? There was another question, right? Grace. Yeah, what is grace? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is grace? Yeah. So grace is basically God's, um, God's uh, prasad, so to say. What do I call in Hindi now? Grace, right? Prasad, like God gives you something, right? A milkman will give you milk. So grace is something that God gives you, which enables, enables your spiritual growth or which enables all the spiritual milestones that you would achieve. And God is not whimsical in distributing his grace. See, the regular grace is available to all of us. The fact that we are born as humans, that is a grace. The fact that we have an able body, that's a grace. The fact that all of us are provided for by, by grains, water, air and everything that we need for sustaining our life is grace. So general grace is available even to Ravan, Kumbhakaran, Kans, everybody. The special grace of God where he ta start taking control of devotee right, and uh, taking him to the next level, that is that follows a rule and that rule is Sharadagat, Surrender. But it, he gives you that grace only when your vessel is ready. Right now, our vessel, if you, if you right now God gives you grace, it's like you, you went to a milkman and asked, put the milk in it. He will put the milk, but the milk will curdle. 
Why it will curdle? Because it's dirty. So what's the point of getting that milk? Then you again go with the vessel. This time it will not curdle, but it will start flowing down because it had holes. Third time again you go, it puts, but it, this much milk came. Why? Because the bucket was inverted. So there are too many problems with our bucket right now. When the bucket is clean, it is ready, which is called Antakaran Shuddhi. Then the grace, God is more than willing to put that grace or that milk in that bucket for us. But that rule is that of surrender. Okay, so we have to do the surrender or the Sharnagati. Now you'll say what is surrender. So there are six principles of surrender which will we can discuss in a part, in, in a particular session. Uh, if I go deep into that, then um, it, it's not a 15-10 minute conversation. So there are multiple aspects of surrender which we can practice on a day to day basis. So that is what grace is. So there was a guy who wanted to have a spiritual experience. He goes to his guru. He says, "You know what, Guruji, I need a spiritual experience today." He said, really? He said, yeah. So he said, go out, look at the heavens, raise your hands and cry, cry out in front of God, okay, for grace, his grace and see what happens. He said, okay, I'll do that. He goes and stands. He had come from his office, his office attire, and he raises his hand, starts crying out, you know, for his grace. And after a while, the overcast conditions come, the clouds converge and then it starts raining. It starts raining and he's fully drenched. And nothing happens. He comes back to his Guruji. He said, you asked me to cry for grace and have that spiritual event. And this is what happened. Okay, look at me right now. So he said, how are you feeling? He said, right now I'm feeling like a fool. He said, that's your first spiritual experience. Okay, so when we think we are somebody, God says, all right, I'm going to wait. The moment you start thinking I'm a fool, I don't know anything, then his grace will start starting. Okay, That is how the process unfolds. So that is your first spiritual experience when you think I am good for nothing. Doesn't mean you become like that. But the point is, our ego is also preventing our you know, grace intervening in our life. Okay, yes, let's take a few more questions. We have eight more minutes. Well, we have a comment from Ganpriya Ji. She says that even low calorie sattvic food is bad for health in large quantities bad for health. Yeah, it's a moderation, right? Um, in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Lord Krishna says that uh, what is, the, there's a verse which where he talks about that everything has to be done in balance, the sleep, the food and everything. In fact, uh, the example that is given is Buddha, he started subsisting on leaves and low calorie food that you're talking about and he became emaciated and while he was sitting there, there were some village ladies who were passing by and they were playing Tanpura. And one of the village lady was saying that don't tighten the string so much that it snaps and don't even lose it so loose that the right cord does not come out. So you have to tighten the string just right. So low calorie food, not good. High calorie food, not good. Moderation is the key. Low sleep, not good. High sleep, not good. Moderation is the key. Everything has to be done in that. Moderation is the message of Bhagavad Gita as well. So we cannot go excessive on uh, either side basically. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, Sam, Radhe, Radhe, please go ahead. Radhe, Radhe, Sam. Mm, Radhe, Radhe. Um, I, I just have a personal matter that uh, we could discuss privately or would you prefer to address no. it here? Personal matter. I mean, I'll leave it up to you. We have eight minutes. If you think it's a seven-minute conversation and the personal thing can be made public, sure, here. If you could, if you would prefer to talk offline, that is fine. Okay, what is it regarding though? It is regarding my personal matter. Okay. okay. And the sure. thing that happened. Put it in the it's feedback. Sure. Can, you, can you put it in the feedback tracker and then we can think about uh, would you be able to put it in the feedback tracker, the topic that you want to discuss? Mm, yes. Okay, sure. Just put it in the feedback tracker. We could certainly talk okay. about or exchange a note about it is that all what is that? yeah put it in the feedback tracker any other okay. questions mm. okay Apanaji, Apanaji says uh, great philanthropists also have expectations but more than that they also go through some emotions if they get misery and start questioning am i doing everything right and good to people and why i am getting this misery 
True. So one of the things with see the Satvik deeds here is the I does not go. You might be doing good deeds, but the ego is silently patting itself in the back that well done. You can't get rid of that ego. Even, even in the Gyan mark, if you go to the peak of Gyan, there are two aspects of Maya, right? Vidya, Vidya or Swarupa Varika and Guna Varika. Guna Varika you can conquer, Swarupa or one of these, I think. Swarupa Varika you can conquer, but Guna Varika you cannot conquer. So the Guna, the Sattva Guna aspect of it, you cannot conquer all by itself. How will you let go of that ego? How will you let go of that pride? Not possible. Even people who are big philanthropists, they, they would have that subtle ego that I'm doing great. So that is why I'm saying the technology to clean or get rid of our these gunas is only by uh, immersing our mind in God because God is the only nirgun or the pure thing. Otherwise, it's it's just not possible. Keep on coloring your mind. You might be coloring with, with crimson color, black color or, or this color of sattva, which is white, but color is a color. You'd still have those imperfections that you'll have to deal with. How will you get rid of your ego? How will you get rid of your pride? And sattvic people, there is... When one guna is remaining, even though it might be sattvic, it can breed other gunas any moment. Right? When you never know when the mode of passion will come or tamas will take, take you over because you are still under the influence of Maya. So you are still not safe in that sense. Yes, Sandhya? Yeah. Um, I had one question by myself and there is a question that came from chat. Um, so actually, I'll just quickly read what Abhaji is asking in chat, uh, when you said donate 10% of income, but if you get a uh, tax deduction, is it truly a devotion without something in return? Tax deduction is something you don't have a choice with, right? So when the what you call that renunciation comes from a position of strength. So that basically um, is not considered, if you look at it, it's, it's the uh, money that is anyway taken. You don't have a choice there, right? I told you that story of a guy, right, who was deliberating whether I should give this much to God and keep this much for myself when he was doing his morning puja or this much to God, keep this much for myself. And finally, wind up came and blew it all away. He said, okay, 100% to God, nothing for me. So um, I, I wish tax deduction would have <laughs> counted. But I think it's something that you have control over, exercise and control over. And then when you have a choice to part with it, that would truly count as a deduction, right? Some people say, I have written my will that all my wealth would be given to charity when I'm gone. Will it count? It counts when you're alive, not when you're gone. It's already taken away from you at that moment, right? So yeah, this is how it typically goes. And 10% is a beginning. Actual devotion, if we, if we go by the strict definition, Swami Vivekananda had said that anything in excess of what you need is actually poison, but that is an advanced stage, but we have to start somewhere. It's very purifying, it's therapeutic, and it removes a lot of cobwebs or chains uh, that we have um, acquired over lifetimes. You know, when those shackles break, it is very liberating when we do that. But yeah, that comes uh, through that experience when we start giving away. Okay, how much time do we have? Two minutes. Let's quickly wrap it up. Like I said, devotional segment, if you want, please put it in the feedback tracker. We'll take two or three every day so that we can wrap up sessions on time. Yes, Sandhya, go ahead. Yeah, so regarding grace, um, I was just thinking about it. So, like, upon surrender, is it that we receive grace or is it that we realize the grace that we have always been receiving? Because God is Kripa Sindhu, right? So, unka like it's just that we are not realizing because our vessel is not prepared. It's just a thought. We can discuss it later as yeah. well. Do we receive or do we realize because grace is always there, right? That is what your question is. It's like the radio waves were always there. Your antenna has become perfectly aligned now, right? Yeah, you might... have become a true receiver now, basically. Yeah, as well, yeah. But uh, they say that uh, uh, we should... Or should the sattva start mixing? So I, I would imagine he, he gives something from top also, or top or from within, something he gives, right? Uh, which pre previously he cannot give because we don't have the capacity to tolerate it or take it. So he, there is some addition also that happens. It's not just it always there. Now we have woken up to it. I think there's some addition also happens if I were to answer that at this point. Okay, great discussion, like always. So thank you, everybody. Uh, Radhe Radhe, have a wonderful day. Great rest of your evening. We'll stay back for the next session. And like I said, uh, um, uh, please fill out the feedback tracker, especially if you want to participate in tomorrow's uh, uh, devotional segment. And I'll see you tomorrow. We'll continue on this discussion and talk about the topic that we spoke about, right? The variety in this world and why so much of diversity in so many parts. 
So Radhe Radhe, thank you from my side. Over to you, Sunil Bhai and Ajay. If you're there. Thank you so much, Radhe Radhe. Ajay Bhai, are you there? Over to you, Ajay Bhai.